Mary's. Yes, St. Mary's. Yes, St. Mary's. And St. Mary's. Lovely. Okay. So Richard, if you want to mute people, go ahead. Um, and um, turn. Um, yeah, turn them back on if anyone's, if, if, and if you see anyone with their hand up, let me know as well. Um, so I didn't, um, I didn't really do a PowerPoint. I should have possibly have discussed that with Richard Webster. Um, I just thought we'd be having a bit of a sort of fireside chat. Um, so I'll start. If you've only just started call changes, this might be um, all Greek to you, um, because the assumption I'm making at the start is that you're all already ringing call changes yourself. If you're starting to think about calling call changes, it's good if you've already been ringing them with other people in charge. So you've got a bit of a feeling for what they're like um, and, and what happens during it. So you've got a bit of experience already. And if you haven't got that already, well, you will eventually. Um, so you, you might find this a bit tricky, but I know amongst the other people who are here, I know there's a range of experience. So some people who are just starting, some people who've been ringing for a couple of years, some people have been ringing for a lot longer than that as well. So you might be at different stages of your journey to start calling call changes. So when, when you stand up to call for the first time, what is it that you're actually being asked to do? You're being asked to look after the band. So um, you're, you're being asked to take responsibility for that so you're not you're no longer just just someone there um, you know ringing you're actually looking after everybody else as well you also need to be able to ring automatically so that your mind is free to make the calls and to watch the other ringers so to some extent you no longer you need to, be, to forget that you've got arms and that you're ringing a bell because you're just doing that on autopilot so that you can think about something else so that's also something that you need to work towards. Mm. Um, the third thing you're being asked to do is to make correct calls. So Richard's already talked to you a bit about what those calls would be um, and, and how to call them and to make sure that you're swapping the right bells and you're, you're saying the right words to do that. Uh, the other thing you're being asked to do is to see the order of the bells. And that's, that's the biggest step that you're going to be taking when you start to conduct. So it's not only making sure that you're right, because you're probably doing that already. Um, it's making sure that other people are right. And so that's quite a big step. So if you've already got rope sight, you'll be honing that. And if you haven't got it yet, some of these steps are going to help you to develop that. So, so you've got quite a few responsibilities there when you start to call. So practically, what we want, to, want you to do is that we want your voice to be clear and to be loud enough to be heard by all the band. That's absolutely critical. Um, if, you, if you whisper to yourself, if you say it a bit uncertainly, then that, that just won't cut it because everybody needs to hear it. The bells are loud. It's quite noisy in a ringing chamber. You might have people who've got some hearing issues. Um, it needs to be loud. And it's often much louder than you think. It's got to be quite commanding and very clear. So that's something that you have to practice and don't feel self-conscious about because the louder and clearer it is, the better the ringing will be because everyone will hear you and they'll do what you want. When do you make the call is the next thing. Um, so you make the call at the hand stroke lead of the bell who is leading. So when you start in rounds, that's going to be the treble. But if the treble's moved away and someone else is leading, then it's going to be that bell instead. So you just, you make the call at hand stroke when whoever's in number one position is pulling down with the Sally. So that's when it happens. And it's got to be there in order to give everyone two blows notice because it's going to take effect at the next hand stroke. So that timing is something you'll need to practice as well because it doesn't come naturally. Um, so you'll have to be looking at who that person is. Say you're ringing the five or the six, um, you've got a call before you pull. So there's a skill in, in learning to do that. But again, it's just practice and you'll, you'll get used to it. And then what's, what's the rule? The rule you're following is that you can only swap a pair of bells who are next to each other in the order, in the, in the row. 
So it doesn't matter if they're physically adjacent to each other. So, you know, it's the one, two, and three, and four. It's about where they are in the sequence. So they have to be next to each other. So a bell can only move one position. It can go one further out towards the back of the change, one further in towards the front of the change, or it can stay where it is. And that's what we've already seen with Richard. Um, so important that you know the, that rule. So that's three things. A good, good loud voice, calling it at the right time at the hand stroke lead, and only swapping bells that are next to each other in the order. So I would say from, from this point on, once you've decided you're going to do some calling, um, you want to make a plan and you want to start doing some homework. So I would start, I would recommend that you start um, writing out a simple sequence of calls and definitely keep it on a few bells. So between four bells and six bells, it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be many bells. So um, you'll need to, the other thing you can use, you can just write it out on paper, just as similar to what Richard was showing then, that you write out the rows, you write the call, and then you, you, you write the new row that shows how that call has taken effect. So you can do that and you can aim to go to something simple like reverse rounds or into queens um, or into even just two, one, four, three, five, six, just something very simple, just so that you can get an idea of how it works on paper. But you can also have another visual aid, which, which we find useful at various towers, which is to have some number cards. So, and these ones are, you can see they're colored, which helps, it helps when you get to Queens actually, and things like that, Queens and, and, and Whittington's. Um, but using number cards is really, excellent um, to get a visual, a visual um, aid for, for seeing what you're doing when you swap things around. Um, and it's good to do with other people because you can do it together. So if you lay them out on the table, on the bench, um, on the floor, whatever you can do, um, and you can make the changes and work out what the call will be in order to, to create the swaps between adjacent pairs of bells. So stick to a small number of bells when you start. Um, and I think four is absolutely fine. If you're at a practice one day when we can ring again and say they want to ring on six bells, but you only really want to call on four bells, no problem. So you'll just call the one, two, three, and four to be affected and five and six can still sit at the back. So that's no problem at all. Um, the, the next really big thing to decide is where you're going to ring. So it should be on a bell that you can ring really well and that to some extent you can ring on autopilot. So you can ring it without having to think too much about how to handle it. Um, and then you've got a few options. You could ring on the treble, which certainly helps with the calls because at the start, you'll be calling as you pull down at hand stroke. So that's a really a useful thing to do. Um, you could choose to ring an inside bell. So by that, we mean something that's, you know, two, three, four, five. Um, and you might well be affected. So you might call yourself to be affected. So you'll have to not only make the call, but then do what you said you, you should do. And that's quite tricky when you start. Um, and the other thing you can do is ring the tenor. So if you keep the tenor behind in sixth place the whole time um, and be unaffected, that's quite a nice place to observe what's going on. So you can just sit out the back. So this is as long as you can ring the tenor comfortably You can just sit out the back and then you can make the calls and watch other people do them. So ultimately you'll need to be able to ring to call changes from all those positions, from the treble, from inside and from the tenor. Um, but when you're starting, be really judicious about which one you choose. So you might wanna start with the treble just to get the calls right, but then you might wanna move around the back so that you can see what other people are doing really clearly without having without being affected at all. And then later, like the third thing you do is to put yourself inside where you will be affected. Do you want to just unmute for a second, Richard? Are you still there? Sorry, I can't unmute everyone. Uh, everyone has, to has anyone got any questions? Is that okay. no? Okay. Okay. What did you want to ask? 
and meetings. Kathy, I previously when I make calls, I usually like to call when the tenor is on the backstroke. Is that good or bad? That's probably good. It might be slightly, it should be just right, really, shouldn't it? But um, it might be a little bit too early. So, hmm. So see if you can watch the treble and, and or the treble or the bell who is leading. That's right. And see if it makes a difference. See if it makes a difference to be calling just as they're pulling off their hand stroke. I would have thought the tennis backstroke would be just slightly early. It's not, it's not dreadful. It's not the end of the world. And if it works, it's worked for you this long, then that should be fine. But see if it makes a difference looking at the bell who's leading that hand stroke. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No? Okay. So, so far, you know what's expected of you and you're starting to make a plan and you're doing homework. Homework is like, this is when seriously homework starts when you want to conduct, that you need to do it outside the tower and you need to have yourself mentally prepared before you get in there and, and then have and hold everyone to ransom once they're ringing. Um, so the more you do on paper or with your special cards, um, the better it will be for you, I think. Okay, so also as part of your homework, you should practice saying the calls. Um, so make sure you know which bell you're going to call first. So this is when you really need to get the concept of up or down really clear in your mind. Um, so often I find that people know that they've got to swap a particular pair of bells, but they don't know which one to call first. And so see if you can work that out at home when you're not under pressure, when you're just writing it out on paper. Um, and then bring it to the tower. And it's okay if it doesn't, if it doesn't go right, that's fine because you're you're learning and you're practicing. Um, so that's that's fine. Once you've made the call, the next thing you have to do as a conductor, which you don't really have to do as just a ringer, is um, make sure that it happened. So if you say two to three, make sure the two follows the three at the next hand stroke. Make sure it's happened. Um, so don't just call it watch it happen as well. So it happens two blows later, make sure it happens because then your, your next call, if it, if it didn't happen, your next call might be impossible. So you need to now just have a bit of surveillance over the band to see what they're doing. And then you should also think about in your mind as well, if things go wrong, what are you going to do? So you've got a few options. If it's just, if you've just made a slight mistake, you could say no call. So you might call something that's wrong or you realize you've got them in the wrong order. Um, you can just say straight away, no call, and everyone can just go back to where they were. And you can discuss with the band that that's what that means. If you say no call, it just means go back to the change you were in before it got a bit messy. But if it gets to the point where things really go bad, um, it's firing out, people are looking around and they don't know what's happening, then you've got two options. You can say rounds, and it can get straight back into rounds. And then you can either start again or you can stop. Or if it's really bad, you can say stand. So that's also, you need to think about that in advance that you'll need to, to con if it's, and I'm assuming at first when you're learning, it's not going to be for anything special. It's not going to be for services or anything like that. It's just going to be a practice night or afternoon or whatever. So there's no big deal, but um, you need to know when to stop because people don't just want to be in a mess for a long time. Um, that can annoy people. So, yeah, be really judicious about either, if you haven't been going for very long, bring it back to rounds and go again. Or if it's been going for a bit too long and everyone's looking a bit tired or, you know, they've had enough, then stand it up. So that's what you can think about. So you've done all your practice at home. Um, you've got an idea of what you want to do when you get to practice that night. Um, and these are the things I would suggest that you start with. So keep it really simple. There's nothing wrong with it being simple. Um, and you want to start getting your eye in for seeing the bells move and what order they're in. So if you're not used to doing that yet, it's going to take a little bit of time. Um, and if you keep it really simple and you've done it at home, you're going to have an idea of what it is that you're looking for. So the very first thing I would suggest is that you just call a bell that is not you um, up one place, then back to its home place, which will be round, 
and then one place down and then back to rounds and that's it and that's good also if you've got a learner in your band who's who's just starting call changes um, because it gives them something to do they can get a bit of practice at, at pulling in or holding up and you're getting practice at watching them do it um, and putting the call in the right place so getting the timing right getting your voice loud and clear um, calling the bells correctly and observing so you get you get to do all those things with a very simple little change so that's the first thing i would do and i'd probably do that for a while um, after that the next step i think would be to call yourself up or down a place or a few places so put yourself you know somewhere in the middle somewhere say you're on bell three um, call yourself down to the lead then call yourself back up to third place um, so You'll have to think about the timing because you'll be calling it before you ring your hand stroke, but that's fine. Good practice. Um, you'll know exactly what you're doing because you're directing yourself to do it. Um, so that's a good way to do it. Um, and it just gives you a bit more practice at, at being bold as well, as well as um, making sure the rest of the band is doing what they need to do because most of them are unaffected and it's just you moving yourself around a little bit. Um, so it's the second thing I would do. Thirdly, I would call into so, like a really simple sequence, something like three, two, one, four, five, six. So it goes three, two, one, four, five, six, which is quite pretty. It's a pretty change anyway. Um, and you can do it, you can just do it on four if you want. Three, two, one, four, three, two, one, four. That's absolutely fine. Or three, two, one, four, five, six, totally unaffected. And it's just that you've turned three, two, one around. So that's a nice, simple sequence and you can watch it. So I wouldn't be involved in that. I would put myself on the four, the five or the six and just watch those three bells switch as you do it. And that this takes a few calls to do that. So you might wanna write that out on paper and work out how to do that. When you're getting a little bit more confident, then I would work up to calling it into a named change. So say Queens, for example, is a very pretty one and it only takes a few calls on six bells. Um, so you call it into queens and then call it back to rounds. So that's quite sophisticated. So don't think you've got to do that first. Don't think that's where you've got to start just because everybody else does it. Just keep it really simple. And then beyond that, when you're really getting confident, when the band has confidence in you as well and they know that you can, you can do it well, then I would call it into a couple of named changes. So go into one change, say queens, then go into kings and then come back to rounds. And that's quite complex, but it's very exciting and fulfilling when it works. Um, if, you've, if you've worked all the way up to that point, you'll be very pleased with yourself. You could also do rounds into titums and then into queens and then back to rounds. So that's quite a long sequence. And I would say that the absolute fanciest thing you can do in call changes, like the epitome of where you're heading, is to call a striking competition sequence where you have to go into five or six named changes and back to rounds and remember all of that in a time limit. Like that's, that's the highest it ever gets, really. Um, so start with the really easy steps. Call one bell, a place up, a place down. Call yourself a few, few places up and down. Call into a simple sequence such as three, two, one, four, five, six. Call into queens and back to rounds. And then call into call from queens to another change and back to rounds. So those are the those are the steps that I would normally see people go through. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, Diane. Do you want to unmute? Um, if you don't know what the bell um, order for Queens is, how would you find out? Uh -huh. um, do you, have you got a ringing library at your tower? Have you got um, the Steve Coleman books? Uh, um, our ringing libraries are on legs. On legs, okay. Um, it'll be online somewhere, but there's a very good um, series of books by Steve Coleman um, for sort of beginner to intermediate ringers. Um, and he's got them listed, but R Richard Webster, would you also say that there's another good website that um, you could look at to look at named changes? There's plenty, I think. Yeah, there's, there's loads. I was just trying to find one to put it in the chat. Um, 
yeah <laughs> there's there's yeah. a there's definitely a website that has all of them on all numbers so yes uh, all, all, i've seen that somewhere too yeah. yes yeah. okay so I'll diane they're, they're they're called different different things on di on different numbers of bells occasionally um or some of them extend very nicely from five to eight to, to ten are you from an eight bell tower six six for you okay well, easy peasy then. Okay, there's not so many to, to worry about. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, okay. Any other questions? Yes, Margaret, it is. Um, when you're making up the cards, you said to have them in different colours. Um, you don't have to. Actually, I think I read that somewhere. And then um, Marianne, lovely Marianne from Katoomba, made them up for me. And it's turned out to be handy because if you're looking at odds and evens and patterns of odds and evens, then the colours are, are an additional aid. So, you know, I've got. So one, you three, have. Five. I mean, if you're in Titums, it doesn't mean anything to have them in red and blue. But if you're in Queens. Yeah. Or you're in Queens or you're in Kings or Whittington's, then it is actually handy to see the alternating colours. So you've only um, got two colours? You only yeah. need two colours? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And I think that's been quite helpful. Okay. Actually, but yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to, you could have them all the same colour if you wanted. But I do find it's a good visual aid and, and they've been laminated so they're easy to, to throw around the tower and for people to handle and to, to switch around as you're doing the, the calls. But sometimes people want to, I found this just at one tower, some people, they want to have them right next to them on the floor. It's like, well, it's not going to help. Um, because they were not going to move by themselves. Um, so they're really just for, they're before ringing or for after ringing, not during ringing. Okay. Yeah. Um, anything else? I've got some notes that I just wanted to, to say, and that is um, keep the tenor behind. When you're starting, so this is about starting calling changes, keep the tenor behind. Do not move the tenor. Moving the tenor is the fastest way to firing out um, with an inexperienced band. Um, so just keep them there. And then the second fastest way to fire out with an inexperienced band is to move someone to the treble who doesn't know how to lead yet or move someone to the lead. So be really aware in the sequence that you're going to call who is going to be brought to the lead um, because can they lead yet? And it might be halfway through. You might be heading for three, two, one. You bring the two to the lead and the two doesn't know how to lead. Um, the timing goes out and then everything falls apart. So be really aware about placing your band, about um, either changing the sequence so that you never bring them to the lead or you put them on a different bell that's never going to come to the lead in this particular sequence that you're going to call. So a good exercise for that is to say, work out what the calls would be to come into three, two, one, four, five, six, without the two ever going to the lead. And so you can just set yourself little challenges like that um, to work out how you would avoid someone being brought to the lead. Um, so yes, be, that's it's a very, very fast way. And I'm sure Marianne knows that we've done that at Katoomba. It's a very fast way to fire out if someone's leading and they haven't quite you know, got the rhythm of it yet. And they'll get to it and you know you can do other exercises for them to make them better but while you're trying to call changes don't don't do that so that's important keep the tenor behind and make sure that anyone who's going to be brought to the lead in your sequence knows how to lead um, the other thing you'll find is that people seem to find it easier to get into their change than to get back to rounds um, and that's absolutely fine and that's really common um, you will work it out um, and it's just practice. It's just practice, just repetition. It's just doing it again and doing it again and then it'll become clearer to you. And so the sort of exercise you could do for that is to start, you could share the calling at the start with someone who's a bit more experienced. So you could say, okay, I'm going to call it into Queens but could then you call it back to rounds. So you get the experience of getting to Queens, you get more confident um, you don't have to go through the whole faff of trying to get back to rounds if you just can't do it. But then after you've done it a few times, you might be able to see and then you can advance into that. So don't, don't think you have to do everything straight up. Um, share, share it with, with somebody else who can do it for you. Um, and then what you really need to do is to put it into practice. So you need to ask for opportunities to have a go. 
So, and if you could do it every week, if you're back to practicing every week one day, um, then make sure you ask every time, just ask for five minutes, ask for 10 minutes, um, but make sure you do it every week as much as you can. Or if you go to another tower, just ask for five minutes because no one's going to, to worry about that. If it doesn't go right, that's fine. At least you've had another try. Um, so that would be, so my homework for you would be write out a bit of a sequence of you know moving bells into whatever you want to move them into reverse rounds or to queens or even something simpler work out what the calls are see if you can memorize the calls without looking at your piece of paper see if you can remember them like that um, and then get ready to be brave to ask for your chance to to do some calling um, and and get people to to help you gain that confidence and give you the opportunity to do it so that's what I would say. Uh, do you want to unmute people, Richard? Do you want to unmute yourselves and ask questions or you, tell you me? You have to unmute themselves, I can't. They do, okay. Yeah. Does anyone want to tell me about any experiences they've already had in, um, in calling that have been either good or bad and, and, and why? Or if you haven't started yet at all? Yeah, Diane. Um, what Pete did, who was our tower captain, um, He's no longer with us anymore, sadly. And um, he wrote up um, the the order of the call changes to go into Queens, Tittums, and I think Whittingtons as well. I can't remember mm -hmm. now, but certainly. And so if you were in the tenor position, if you got lost, you had the sheet. Back up. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I mean, that that's good to start with, but then you, I think, that you run the risk of depending on that and not thinking it out through you, for yourself. Yeah, I, I agree that having a visual aid in the tower is, is helpful, but you can't become completely dependent on yeah. that yeah. because it, it's not actually helping you to, I mean, you can already read, like that's the skill it's giving you. Can you read? Yes. Um, can you see the order of the bells? Well, you, you don't get that by reading the board. Yeah, that's right. So that's you right. do have, so it's fine. It's absolutely fine to start with. And it's a, it's a great yeah. thing, but you should shift yourself off the tenor so you can try and do it from memory. Try to do it by seeing what's happening. Yes, yes. Hmm. But, you know, baby steps, do one thing at a time yeah. and get the confidence. Yeah. Any other experiences? I think Priscilla had something in the chat. I don't know if Priscilla wants to. I called the tenor around once without warning them and I was going to be very confused. Don't they? Don't they just? So, yes, if you call the tenor in, and some people do call the tenor in, um, and that's, um, it's perfectly legitimate, but you need people who know how to ring without a cover bell. So that's why I would never do it with an inexperienced band um, unless you particularly want to fire out. You know, sometimes <laughs> that's fun. Maybe you want to. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's fine. You can do it. But the more experience you get, sure, you can do that. That's not a worry. What's your opinion on repeating changes, Kathy? Repeating changes? What do you mean? Do you mean how so, uh, how many calls uh, between each call or how many changes so if you, between If you each call? go into Queens and you, you get there by maybe one, three, two, five, four, six, and then you go into Queens, one, three, five, two, four, six, get out of Queens. Is it okay to then repeat that previous change? The one, like call the five and the two back. One, three, two, five, four, six. I think exploding hag who wrote that out. Um, yes, I think so. I mean, if you're starting to call, you don't want to give people too many strange bell ringing rules, do you? I think yeah. as long as the bells are ringing, as long as it sounds nice, as long as everyone's having a good time, um, then it doesn't matter that it's it's not really false. I mean, call change is never false, is it? Because you're repeating rows all the time. So no, that's fine. I think as you get fancier, you can you can move through the changes without repeating, but it doesn't matter at the beginning at all, I don't think. But you should find what you think is a pretty change um, for you in your tower and, and go with that. You might, you could even come up with a special pretty change that you call your, you know, your tower special favourite or whatever. So, uh, yeah, you can be inventive with it and you can enjoy it. Anybody else? Joy, have you called much at Orange? Yes, yeah, fair bit. Fair bit. Mm -hmm. yep. And does it go well? Oh, mostly, I think, yeah. Yeah, good. 
Yeah, that's great. And what about the Dibleys? What are you doing down there? I can't see you, but have you called? I tried. I have tried. Yeah. Um, but I love the way you say, I'll do it for five minutes because it takes me five minutes to make one call change because I'm exactly. looking at myself. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's, that's yeah. what can take a long time. That's right. <laughs> if you're So the more homework you do, the more prep you do, the less there'll be that sort of hesitation in the tower. But it does take time, doesn't it, to work yes. out what you're seeing when yes. all the ropes are moving. Yeah. Any other questions or any clarification required? Uh, thank you, Cathy, very much. I'm getting You're ready. Welcome. Oh, very good. St. <laughs> <laughs> Mary's colours. I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready. Beautiful. You have a laminator, Margaret. I've got a laminator. I'll go and do that now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Brownie points. Excellent. I'm very excited. <laughs> well, if you want me to, I can... Um, Write some notes if you want me to and just summarise what I said. I'll give it to Richard if that's helpful. Um, but otherwise, I, I want to um, hear that you've all been giving it a go, ready, in, you know, doing your practice at home by self, ready to get started again when we're back in the tower. Sounds great. Thanks, Cathy. You're thanks, welcome. Richard. You are welcome. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Cathy. Nice. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Cathy. That was great. Really thank you. Thanks, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. It's it, is it? Yes, thank you, Kathy and Rich. You're welcome. All right, thanks everyone for joining. Bye. Yes, Thank, thank you. you. See you at the next one. The great, the great yeah, initiative. See you at the next one. Yes. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye. Oh, Richard. Yeah. It's Karen, it's Karen Dibley here. I had major problems trying to get onto um onto Eventbrite. So I'm not sure what happened. Yeah. So sorry I missed your your seven o'clock one. It took me half an hour. Oh and no. Then, and then I still couldn't and then there was no nothing about Kathy's one. So I just went back to your calendar and just clicked on the Zoom. Um Yeah, I think link. I think I might stop using the Eventbrite. Um it was useful to get the numbers, but I, I, yeah. I, found, I found it confusing to, to use from the like organizer point of view. Okay. Um, so. And also because you uh, get a, because I, I, I made a booking for yours um, yeah. and you get um, a confirmation, but with no Zoom link. And so then yeah. it's like, hmm. and then I got a reminder that said, go back to the event and log in and then you'll get this. Yes. So that just needs to be you know, simplified yeah. slightly. Yeah. yeah. I, th I think oh. I'll just. Um, uh, just put the Zoom link on the, on the calendar. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, I don't, I don't think we need a sign up sheet really. Um, although it would be good to know who's going to be there in case there's yeah. not, a, not a lot. I suppose you could but, just um, um, just tell people to um, um, email register me. with Eventbrite, but you'll be sending them a a link a separate to, link. to Zoom. Yeah, yeah because yeah. like I, I, I did everything and I I'll, I'll activated I'll make that and then yeah, yeah. it just um it didn't accept my password. It wouldn't let me change my password. It wouldn't send oh, me a link. Sakes. And I thought, oh yeah. god, this you know, Richard's probably thinking, you know, I don't care about you know going to this, but like, <laughs> oh, I thought you know. must already know that first half hour's worth. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can always I, learn something, but yeah, if you can just put the Zoom link in, yeah, I thought I'll 